the Word of God together this morning for our Resurrection Sunday sermon. Go with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, we'll be going through a few uh, verses this morning. I would encourage you, if it's not your practice around this time of year, I encourage you perhaps to read all of the gospel accounts, all of the gospel narratives in relation to the death of Barry and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach that fully rounded understanding of the glorious gospel of who Christ is and what he has done. And uh, we'll primarily be in Matthew's gospel in a little while, but I would encourage you to read the other accounts as well. I'm thankful for Ross reading John's to us this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Uh, those of you who are around here regularly will always be hearing these verses referred to. But let us read them this morning because they are the sum and the substance of everything that, if you will, Easter represents. Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1 says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are Saved. We use that word a lot around here. If you're a Christian, you're saved. If you're not a Christian, you are lost. The Bible says you're saved in Christ. Amen. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That's believed in nothing as opposed to the gospel. Verse number three, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the apostle Paul is writing here and reminds us that he received the truth of the gospel, not by man. He wasn't taught it by, by any man. We won't turn this morning, but make a note of the verse if you don't know. Galatians 1, 11 and 12 tells us that the apostle Paul received the gospel of the grace of God, the death, burial, and resurrection, directly from the Lord himself. He wasn't taught it by any man. Verse number four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, Simon Peter, <coughs> then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as the apostle Paul, as of one out of due time. And we'll end our reading there this morning. May God be pleased to bless the reading of his word to our hearts. The clear summation and the condensed version of the absolute truth that is the gospel, the good news, the good tidings for the the church age, that you're saved by having the gospel preached, taught to you, hearing it, receiving it, believing it. What is that gospel? That Christ died for your sins and my sins according to the scriptures, the Holy Bible, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that by then the witness statements of the evidence given by those who knew him, he then was seen for 40 days, heard, handled, touched and spoken with the resurrection hope. And it's on that great truth of the glorious gospel that I'd like to speak this morning under the title heading of the power of the empty tomb, the power of the empty tomb. Let's take a moment and pray and ask the Lord to meet with us and help us this morning, our Father. <coughs> what a wonderful joy it is to read such familiar verses, familiar to us, but may we never take them for granted. May we marvel, may we be amazed, may we continue to be astounded by the sacrificial death, burial, and the resurrection, and the witnessing of that great truth by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Shepherd, the Lamb, who died in our place and shed his precious blood, through which we who believe in that are saved, cleansed, purified, forgiven with our sins forgotten, saved, sealed, and secured for all eternity. 
not by the works of our own righteousness that we have done, their filthy ranks, but by the perfect, atoning, substitutionary work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and the empty tomb portraying the hope to all who will believe. Our God, help your people this morning at New Hope Baptist Church to live in light of the new hope and the new life we have through Christ alone. It's through his precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So if you will, Easter weekend, in a sense, we, we could call it the gospel weekend, couldn't we? As I've already said, we know Christ wasn't crucified on the Friday, but nonetheless, the weekend is about the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. History, the good news, if you will. We won't turn there this morning, but Philippians chapter 2, verses 11 to 15 covers that so succinctly where it speaks of Christ in glory. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3 covers. Of glory stepped down in humility and became the Christ of humility. He then lived for 33 perfect and sinless years among sinful men and went to become the Christ of, of Calvary and died on Calvary's cross. He then rose three days and three nights later and became the Christ of victory. And then 40 days after that, he arose and ascended back to heaven and he is now again the Christ of ascendancy, the Christ of majesty, the Christ of glory, the Christ who awaits the instruction from God the Father to come to call his people back to him. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse number one. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I've got to prepare a place for you. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, by the way, that's the biblical the Lord Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ of potentially your own imagination, not the Lord Jesus Christ of some false religion, but the Lord Jesus Christ as he's declared in the word of God, the truth and the witness statements. If you believe in that Lord Jesus Christ, then let not your heart be troubled this morning. If you come in with a troubled heart this day, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then I'm going to urge you for the next uh, uh, few moments. No, I'm lying. Well, the next however many moments. It's rarely a few. But would you pay attention this morning? May the Lord have your ears to hear this morning because I have the most important news if you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning. He said, lots of things are important in my life. This is important in your life and eternity. Everything else will fade and perish and rust and grow old, but this is a truth for all eternity. Now, with relation to the death and the burial and the resurrection and the witnessing of that by the Lord Jesus Christ, by those who knew him, uh, the greatest and those all around to whom he revealed himself, I want to say this today, that there are those today that without considering the facts of history, without considering the facts of biology or medical facts, or the facts of archaeology or even the facts of uh, theology will make very foolish uh, claims sometimes uh, that the, 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 the death and the resurrection of Christ are an elaborate hoax or an elaborate myth. Now, it is possible, it's not for, you could say, well, it's either true or not true. That's absolutely the case. It's either true or not true. But there is no ground in between to say, well, you know, Jesus came, he did some good teachings, but, but the, 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 the death and the resurrection, they're, they're all a bit of a hoax, you know, and, and they present different ways the, to dismiss the resurrection uh, truth. This is a nonsense that is purported by many people, and, and one of the greatest, I suppose, number of people in the world today uh, receive this nonsense from, from the Quran book of nonsense written in the 7th century. Now, the Quran can be a religious book to Muslims and fair play to them. Have at that. Believe your book. Do as you like. We see the results of that the world over uh, as death and destruction and hopelessness from belief in that book. But the reason I say it because they speak of Jesus Christ. Remember, this book was written in the 7th century. And they speak of Jesus Christ and they speak of the resurrection as not happening as declared. Now, think about this for a moment. That was written some 600 years 
after the people who walked with Christ and witnessed with Christ and Christ's own word. And we have a book that have Christ's words and the words of those who walk with Christ. Then there's another book out there that purports to be a holy book that speaks of Christ that was written 700 years later by a man who first thought he was mad, written down in a Quran that speaks of Jesus six, seven hundred years after his death, burial, and resurrection by nobody who ever knew him, walked with him, or knew him personally. Can I ask you, who are you going to believe? Uh, are you going to believe, listen, if you speak some words of your own life and your friends and family around you also write down what they saw and what they heard, and then somebody in 600 years' time, 700 years' time, never knew you and then decides to write a book about what they thought your life was like, which one is accurate? The people who never knew you hundreds of years later or your own very words about your own life and the people who knew you. Which one is accurate? It's simple. So we can put the Quran on the shelf to where it should be in the books of fiction in the library, particularly where it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but don't perpetuate that. But sadly, there are other religions around that sometimes call themselves Christian that produce their own fanciful notions about why it wasn't really Jesus Christ himself in bodily person who was crucified on the cross, uh, why it wasn't actually a bodily resurrection and various things in between. And that sits alongside other humanists, I'll put it in air quotes, academics, who purport the same kind of hoax and swoon theories. It's been phrased like this sometimes, that Christ didn't so much have a resurrection, but he had a, a resuscitation. Uh, we'll come to that in just a little while. Because when we go through the facts of the overview that I've just read in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8, I think we ought to be able to put that nonsense to bed. So I'm just going to look at three simple points from the verses that we've said this morning. That is the gospel this morning. And firstly, we look at verse number three, which is the death of Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be sure from the biblical account, was Christ really dead on that cross? And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail this morning because I want you to be in no doubt whatsoever that Christ was not alive when he came down off that cross. Medical evidence supports it. The biblical account supports it. Uh, we heard from John's gospel. Turn with you to Matthew chapter 27, please. Matthew chapter 27. That will stand out in the minds of Bible believers among us because Matthew 27, 50 is where the New Testament starts, Hebrews 9, 16 and 17. The Bible declares that the New Testament starts at the death of the testator and Matthew 27, 50 is where Christ gave up the ghost and died. That is where the New Testament uh, starts. But in Matthew 27, we're not going to read the full account. That's why I had Ross read the overview to us this morning. But, but let's just look at, at, at a few verses here because we need to figure out how did Christ die? Was he crucified? Did he just vanish? Uh, was he imprisoned? What is the actual facts? What is the truth according to the scriptural narrative and the witness accounts? Now, if you're in Matthew 27, I'll just call out a few verses as we read them. The first one I'd like us to read is, is verse number 26. And it's speaking of Pilate, and we already know Christ was brought before Pilate. And in reference to Pilate, verse 26 of Matthew 27 says, Then released he Barabbas, that murderer, then released he Barabbas unto them, to the Jews who called out, Crucify him, crucify him, about the innocent, perfect Son of God. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I want you to remember that scourging just for a moment that occurred before he was delivered to be crucified. Keep that in your mind, and I'll come back to that. Down to one. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment, that's his clothing, on him and led him away to crucify him. And verse number 32 also. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. There was a man, Simon of Cyrene, that was compelled by the soldiers 
to need to carry the Lord Jesus Christ's cross after he'd been scourged, before he'd been crucified. That's important. Commit that to your memory for a moment, please. Then jump down to verse number 35, and I'll come back to all of this and summarize. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. Psalm 22, which speaks of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ before crucifixion had even been invented. And uh, so we find that to be important. Now jump down to verse number 38. Then were there two thieves crucified with him. We're making the case that the actual Lord Jesus Christ in his bodily presence was actually crucified on an actual cross among others by the soldiers of Rome. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. So Christ was not alone when he was crucified. There were others being crucified. Now, now verse 42. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Verse 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. And lastly, verse number 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. There is no room or margin for any doubt or disputation whatsoever in the scriptures. And as I've said, if you read the correspondence, There is no error. There's not even any intimation that there was anybody other than he who had walked bodily, that was born uh, to a virgin as a babe, that grew and walked among men, that he who was known to be the fleshly body, the Son of God, and the God of Son, fully God, fully man, that he it was himself who was actually crucified on an actual cross, on an actual day, with actual other people. That's what the witness accounts uh, tell us. But my friends, so so we can we can eliminate any talk of anything other than the crucifixion. But but the, the, the question is, is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So we must deal with the with the with the nonsense that's purported that that Christ himself didn't actually die. It was a hoax. I think we can simply dismiss any kind of nonsense that it's some kind of other spirit that was upon the cross. It wasn't the real Jesus. It was some kind of apparition or hoax on the cross. That's a complete nonsense, and it's incongruous to the scriptures that talk about Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, by God himself, and by those who walked with him. So we can eliminate that. So we need to deal with the fact, was Christ actually dead? Was he fully dead? Or was there some kind of hoax perpetuated uh, the swoon theory, if you will, that's put forth that, you know, Christ wasn't fully dead. You know, when they gave him the vinegar, it was some kind of drug that imitated death. And then they put him in the tomb, you know, and lo and behold, he recovered, moved the stone, walked out. Let, let's have a look at the account and see whether there's any room for that possibility, because we need to be sure in our own mind. I mentioned verse 26, first of all, then released the Barabbas into them, and when he had scourged, Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Scourging. This was the brutal warm-up for the Lord Jesus Christ before the main event that was the crucifixion. You know, some of you train, run, and things like that. You tend to do a warm-up before your main event. Well, the, the warm-up for the, the barbaric death of crucifixion was the equally barbaric scourging of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 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 set apart from your mind any kind of thought that this was some kind of little, little leather whipping tool like the ascetic monks used, you know, when they strip their robe off and, and like to hit themselves on the back, going, oh, I'm so naughty for my sin, and purge themselves with ascetic behavior, and then with a few little stripes or a trickle of blood on their back. There's one thing that the Romans were efficient at. <laughs> Over the 400 years of their empire and their, their soldiers were masters, great tacticians. But I'll tell you what they were good at, 
tactics, overwhelming force with minimum amount of numbers and certain death and torture. They were perfect at instituting absolute obedience to Roman law. And a part of this that was short of death, capital punishment, but sufficiently serious that if you lived, if you lived, if you were scourged, you wouldn't go on to be a rule breaker again. Now, the scourge generally consisted of 39 lashes across the back, from the top of the back down to the top of the buttocks. The multiple stranded leather whip was wielded by an expert who knew just the right place to crack that to inflict the <coughs> maximum amount of damage and destruction. And this is what Jesus Christ was led to to be tied to a post, his back stripped bare, and those leather throngs woven in amongst them were steel ball bearings and sharp bones. And the scourging itself took place such that in the hands of an expert scourger, they knew just when to pull that scourge back, that it would hook it, it would rip the very flesh from your body. But don't take my account for it. Can I read to you an eyewitness account by the third century Eusebius of what he saw when he saw somebody scourge? Let me read his words to you. The sufferer's veins were laid bare, and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. Christ's back would have been shredded. Parts of his spine would have been on display. Some of his internal organs would have been opened to be visible. Many died from the scourging alone. Many could not survive a scourging. Now, we're answering the question, did Christ really die? From the scourging, even medics today and medical experts today would say that from an injury of such horrific trauma and blood loss and seriousness that it would be most obvious and apparent that Christ would start to go into what they call hypovolemic shock. Hypo, low, vol, volume, emic, like ischemic, blood. Low blood volume. And his internal organs would start to shut down. From the loss of fluid, he would start to lose strength and he would start to be very faint indeed. And if left unattended, death would be the certain result. As a sign of, of, of hypovolemic shock with somebody who couldn't walk properly, who couldn't stand properly, who, who couldn't carry any load, was Simon of Cyrene committed by the soldiers to carry the cross of Christ? Yes, he was. We've just read it. Why? Because Christ was probably in a hypovolemic shock from the scourging. Now, I, I want to paint a real picture for you today because in case, just in case, I don't know what state you're in, in your biblical understanding. I don't know how susceptible you are to foolish nonsense out there in the world. I want you to understand the horror, the barbarity, and the certainty of death that was coming upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to think about this. Think of the condition of Christ's body as we work towards discussing whether the swoon theory might be correct and Christ was just faking it on the cross and was able to then suddenly reappear full of energy and speech to his disciples. Christ undoubtedly suffered from the scourging, undoubtedly was in hypovolemic shock, undoubtedly looked terrible, felt terrible, and without any medical intervention, certain death was most likely to ensue anyway. It said that then he delivered him to be crucified. That most bloody, brutal, and barbaric form of torture that was perfected by the Roman Empire in itself. It was the form of death that had become the established form of punishment, capital punishment, death-creating punishment within the Roman Empire. It was viewed to be so barbaric and so cruel that Roman citizens were actually exempted from crucifixion. 
That's why we believe the Apostle Paul, where, where he talks in 2nd, 2nd Timothy about, about his, his laying his life forward, shedding his blood as water on the ground, would have been beheaded because that was more merciful capital punishment. It was instant. It didn't have pain and agony and torture attached for it, to it. But crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals who were not Roman citizens, the only exception to Roman citizens that would be put to death by crucifixion were any that were convicted of high treason. That's how serious it was deemed. Every other Roman citizen, you wanted to murder, rape, pillage, rob, you didn't get crucified. That was too barbaric for a Roman citizen. That is what Christ was delivered to. A form of death so cruel. A cause of death that created such unique agony and suffering, they actually invented a new word to describe it. Because of the agonies and the suffering that was witnessed, was, was seen to be such a way that in Latin there wasn't a word that adequately described it. That word is still in existence and common usage in our English language today. The word used to describe the suffering of the cross was excruciating. That's the word in English. Ex meaning out, as in exit. Cruciating from crucer or cru cross. It means out of the cross excruciating you know if, if you say you're in excruciating pain that is really defining it as a cut above anything that you've ever experienced before isn't it that word comes from there was no other way to describe the horror and barbary of crucifixion that they invented a new word to describe the agony the pain and the suffering in latin excruce excru that's the kind of pain and suffering from someone who has been crucified it's that new Christ was scourged and then led to be crucified to an excruciating, agonizing death of someone viewed as lower than a Roman citizen. Christ in his state would have been laid on that cross and the nails would have pierced through his hands and feet. Now, there's some discussion whether it was through the center of his hands or through the wrist, which was clasped as the hand also in ancient language. And if you ever just poke your finger right on your wrist hard, you'll feel your median nerve. And you'll just tap it and you'll feel, ooh. And then. Crucifixion through the hands and through the feet. Archaeology discovered one, you remember, uh, Jerusalem was sacked in AD 70, uh, you know, after that final rebellion when the Romans crushed it and, and, and they crucified multiple Jews. Well, archaeologically, there was a find of one Jew, the name's gone, it's not uh, Tacthus, something like that. And they found his feet bones still intact with a seven inch nail through it and then wood still attached to the back. Can you imagine the agony? Scourged, hypovolemic shock. Not in enough shock that the excruciating pain of the nails being driven through the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ was numbed. It wasn't. He felt every blow. He felt every piece of excruciating pain. A crown of piercing thorns being placed upon his head. That only comes slowly by crucifixion. The very weight of your body hanging on the nails in your feet and in your hands, your arms above your body. Oftentimes the arms would stretch by six inches, dislocating the arms from the sockets, not breaking the bones. That's important in, in fulfillment of another prophecy. Arms detached from the sockets, slowly suffocating. To inhale, then you'd have to let yourself down again to exhale. And that became harder and harder and harder, more and more difficult. As a result of that, those of you who are familiar uh, medically, from that slowing of breathing and the rapid pace of the heart trying to keep the body alive, then you'd see pericardial effusion. Water would fill the sac around the heart. Then there would also be a plural effusion. 
Because you can't breathe properly, water would then start to fill around the linings of the lungs. Water would be around the heart, water would be around the lungs. You would slowly and eventually suffocate. Christ may have died from, from the shock, from the hypovolemic shock, from the loss of fluids, from the crucifixion itself, completely horrendous and horrific. So, oh, that, that didn't really happen. Really? Let's go back to John 19. We read it this morning. You see, what we find is the scriptural account matches modern medical fact. The record from 2,000 years ago matches the medical record of someone and the symptoms and the effects of someone being scourged and then being crucified. John goes into great detail in a particular area of his epistle. Let's let's pick it up from uh, verse number 30. I know we've already uh, looked at John's epistle today, but we didn't look at all of this. So John chapter 19, verse number 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, now this is where the detractors and, the, and those who exempt themselves from any medical, archaeological, or historical knowledge say, yeah, the vinegar was drugged, and he and he, he bowed his head, he passed out on the cross. Okay, let's carry on reading, shall we, in light of what I've just said. The Jews, therefore, because it was here, it was, again, the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, which wasn't the Friday, it was the, the high Sabbaths that come before it. For well, that Sabbath day was a high day, extra Sabbath, wasn't Friday. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. As we know, as I've said, the Roman soldiers were experts at death, but also those that were charged with prison guard duty, they watched over the prisoners with account of their own lives. If a prisoner escaped from a Roman soldier put on guard duty, then the Roman soldier was put to death. They took no chances with the prisoners. No prisoner who must be capitally punished and put to death could be allowed to live. No prisoner could be allowed to escape, escape unless you as the guard forfeited your life for it. That's the level of diligence that had to be applied. I know one or two prisoners through my 20 years in the prison service that wouldn't be alive today if we applied the same Roman element. Verse number 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, that's the, the criminals on the side of Christ, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Again, important for fulfillment of prophecy. Again, so far we could say there's possibly a chance that he wasn't dead. Okay, but let's go on. Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Anybody think that a Roman soldier didn't know how to use a short spear? <laughs> That was their major weapon, apart from their short sword. I mean, they were experts. One of the shoulders with a spear, I don't think he kind of went, uh, is he, I'll just prick him a little bit, see if he goes, ouch. No. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there at blood and, what else does it say? Water. What did I just say? Pericardial and plural effusion. They are medical things that happen to anybody today who ends up with a racing heart, the body struggling to stay alive, the body starting to break down, the lungs start to fill up with water, the heart sac starts to fill up with water, and then and when the soldiers put the spear in, they already believed him to be dead. All that was was a confirmation, and they expertly placed that spear right up through his side such that when they pulled it out, John tells us not only blood came out, but water came out. The Bible tells us Christ was dead. Medical evidence tells us Christ was dead. The witnesses tell us Christ was dead. The fact the soldiers weren't put to death tell us Christ was dead. When Christ died on that cross, he died. He was not just unconscious. He was not faking. He was dead. 
The heart had stopped. His body had finished. He was dead. Now, those of you who have been around a few years know that we're body, soul, and spirit, and Christ was the same, right? Christ had commended his spirit back to the Father. His soul went down into the lower regions to do some work, and it's the body that was going to the tomb, but that body was dead. So, Pastor, it seems like you're really emphasizing the horror of the cross this morning. This is, this, that's so gory. I thought this was going to be about the, the hope of the resurrection. I want you to understand the length to which God the Father went, the horror that he allowed to be inflicted upon his only begotten son because of God's love for the world, and the horror of the cross emphasized, emphasizes the horrendous nature of sin. The horror uh, of the cross should emphasize how important and how seriously God views sin. And my friend, if I speak to you first as a believer, as a Christian, it is shocking and should be shocking to you that you would treat and take sin lightly, knowing just a little, just a little of the horrors and the barbaric brutality that God the Son went through to pay the price for your sin. Why do you take it so lightly, my friend? Why do you treat sin lightly? The suffering of the cross indicates the seriousness of sin. See, Christ died on that cross for your sins and for my sins because we were dead in sins. That's why he died on the cross. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, thankfully, this is being written to those who are already Christians, who are already saved, who have already believed and received the death and the burial and the resurrection hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's why Christ died such a serious, horrific death, because sin is a serious business. And sin is a serious business and has been since the fall, since the beginning, because sin is what separates you from God. Sin is what takes us to hell. Sin is what cannot be in the presence of a holy God in a holy heaven. And that's how serious sin is to God, that he allowed his son to suffer and to bleed and to die horrendously and horrifically. It wasn't just to display the inhumanity of man to man, whilst that is on display. It is show the hideous, heinous nature of your sin. And you who hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time passed, note the past tense to the believer, you walked according to the course of this world. You know, you, you did and you lived and you spoke and you acted and you behaved just like everybody else. We have all been there. Past tense. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see, when we're unsaved, we're under the wrath of God, John 3, 36, because of our sin that separated us from the loving God and because of our disobedience not to receive the graceful offer and the free gift of salvation that God gives. Uh, if you're unsaved this morning, say, I'm not being directed by Satan. Yeah, you just don't know it. God says, yes, you are. You're under his influence. Well, I'm influenced by those around me. Yes, who are influenced by Satan if they're not saved. But a sad thing it is when those who name the name of Christ don't depart from iniquity. When those who name the name of Christ revert to being children of disobedience and treat sin lightly, knowing that Christ suffered in agony to pay the price for your sins. And you took the free gift and you mock Christ on his cross. You laugh at his agony by treating sin lightly. Verse number three, among whom also we all had our conversation, that's our manner of living in times past, 
in the lusts of our flesh. That's your problem, Christian, the lust of your flesh. And of the mind, that's where it starts, from the mind to the heart. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others, but God who is rich in mercy. That's how rich our God is. He had his own son crucified for you. That's how merciful and loving and kind our God is to you. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Loved, past tense. God's love is at Calvary's cross. If, if, if you're not in Christ today, if you're unsaved, if you're not under the love of God today, I be no doubt about it. the wrath of God abideth present tense on you, John 3, 36 says. The only difference between you and a saved sinner like myself is I'm now in the love of God because I went to Calvary to get the love of God and I received the love of God and I'm now in the love of God and I'm no longer under the wrath of God and I've accepted the gift of Christ's salvation from Calvary's cross and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And I want to keep that in focus because I... I do not want to take sin lightly. I do not want sin to be my habit. I don't want to be uncaring and unthinking as I look at the Christ of Calvary and the agonies of his bruised, brutally mauled body, pierced and nailed to Calvary's cross. And he did that for me and he did that for you because he loved us and we didn't even love him. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Go with me to Romans chapter 6, if you would. Romans chapter 6. You see, the horror of the cross and the death of Christ in such a horrific way on the cross is evidence of witness of God's love to those who have rejected him. It's still a gift on offer today. Romans uh, chapter 6, let's go from verse number 1. Again, this is written to those who are already saved. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, now what's he saying? This Shall we carry on as sinners like the world so that we can show what wonderful grace Christ had on the cross in the fact that he's paid the price for our sin so we can carry on just living in sin how we like uh, and then uh, just tell everybody what we're Go to heaven because of the grace of God. So we live in sin and become grace abusers. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may be abound? Verse number two, God forbid. God put a stop to that. Christian, if you're, if you're living in open sin and openly mocking the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I say to you, God forbids it. God forbids it. Stop doing that. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Uh, that's spiritual baptism, by the way, not water baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. It's all about that, that, that crucifixion. My friend, people will say to me, oh, that, that, that's foolishness. Christ died for you because you were dead in your sins. That's foolishness in the 21st century to preach about some Savior dying on a cross. Well, the Bible tells me that because God knew that because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. What? Foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells me. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. My friends, could you have any doubt in your mind whatsoever just from a few moments this morning that Christ was dead on that cross? He was brutally murdered on that cross for our sins. Then comes the burial. I, I'm going to go very fast now. That's taken longer.
I want to say about the burial, but it's a part of the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us. Back to Matthew 27, Christ is dead on the cross, the day is coming to an end, and in Matthew 27 we find stepping onto the scene one of Joseph of Arimathea. In verse number 57 of Matthew 27, <clears throat> We find this, when the even was come, there came a, a rich man of Arimathea, a wealthy man, a businessman, we believe, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. Now, we don't hear much about Joseph. Like Nicodemus, we believe they were pretty much secret disciples of Jesus. But now, the horror of the cross meant that Joseph of Arimathea was going to step forward and step out and stand up for Jesus Christ and be counted. And he didn't care who saw it, and he didn't care who was bothered by it, and he didn't care he knew it. He said, I'm getting that body off the cross. Christ is not staying dead, hanging on that cross. Verse 58, he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Now again, can you imagine anyone of any intelligence with any rudimentary medical understanding thinking for a moment that, yeah, they put Christ in the tomb, he just recovered because it was cool, and they thought, oh, I'm alive, I'm all right, and just jumped off the slab there and rolled the stone away with his internal organs bleeding out, with a spear pierced through his heart and through his lungs, and he just came to in the cool air of the tomb and said, ha, fooled you all, I'm alive. And just imagine if that had have been the case. Let, let's, just, let's just play with stupidity for a moment. What kind of condition would Christ be? Well, well, he couldn't have moved that stone for a start, but let's say somebody else moved the stone. Could Christ have walked on the Emmaus, on the Emmaus Road and spoken to the disciples? Ha! Huh. You haven't seen me for a bit. I've just been scourged and crucified, but I'm doing okay now with you know with his liver hanging out. And, I, I mean he would have just died. He couldn't have appeared, he couldn't have been touched, he couldn't have, he couldn't have come into the room, he couldn't appear, he couldn't have spoken to them. He would have needed emergency medical attention. What an utter nonsense it is for those that say the cool of the tomb resuscitated Christ. He was merely unconscious. What an utter nonsense. He was buried in the tomb because he was dead. No doubt he was dead. But the reason I mentioned the, the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, because you understand, it's the only gift that Jesus Christ rejected. I mean, he got a nice tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich guy. Have you ever been around graveyards? Do you ever go around the graveyards? I mean, there's some there's some incredible headstones and they're all night and so I've got their obelisks and the little balls on the top and oh, and so you know he and some wonderful verses you know what, what, what was, what was his fight Milligan and I told you I was ill something like that I, mean, I thought that was a good one. I'm going to tell you this: my hope is not in a headstone. You can sling me in the back of a refuse truck if they take it, because I'll be absent from the body, present with the Lord. And what you do with this lump of carcass, I couldn't care less, because the Bible tells that no matter what happens to this, God's putting it back together when he recreates this vile body into a new glorified body. So I've said to Don, if I die first, find the cheapest possible way. I said, it's probably illegal, but I really love Baggy Point in North Devon. I said, sling me off that end to the sea, right? Say bye-bye. We'll do it at sunset because it's beautiful. Uh, I said, don't worry because I'll be with the Lord. I don't need a headstone with some words on. Huh? You know, I know a lot of people, oh, it was, it was a poorly attended funeral. People I used to work with, they, they marked the measure of a man by whether 200 people turned up for the funeral. I couldn't care whether two people turned up to my funeral. That's a lump of meat that will be in that box. It's not me. It's just the it's just the, uh, the unit that God gave me to move around in. I'll be with the Lord. And Jesus Christ got a wonderful tomb, a rich man's tomb. I mean, that would have been a pretty cool tomb, you know. You ever met a rich man that just went away humbly and anonymously? No, there were buildings and wings in hospitals named after them, all very humble, of course. But they want to make sure they leave something behind. 
All I want to leave behind is this carcass. And Jesus said the same. Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, if you will, metaphorically, metaphorically said to him, he wanted Jesus, here's the best tomb that money could buy. And three days and three nights later, Jesus rejected that gift. He said, no, thank you. I'd rather go home to heaven. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm not worried about the headstone. I'm not worried about the writing. I'm not worried about the inscription. Here lies Jesus, you know, a good teacher and a social moral example. You know, preach the Sermon on the Mount and nothing else. And if we all live by that, how wonderful we'll be. He said to Joseph Aaron, you can shove it. It's just a bunch of old rock. The carcass can lie in there for three days while I'm doing some work down there and some work up there. But in three days and three nights, oh, that stone's going out the way and I'm coming out. I'm not staying in the tomb. Praise God. So I'll jump over the barrel straight to the resurrection. Otherwise, we're never going to get through this. Stay in Matthew. Look at verse 28. I know we covered some of this on Friday. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week, by the way? I need to check some of you. Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week, not Monday. And that'll help you with your Bible. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They were the ones that were swooning. They were the ones that were playing dead because they were scared to death in the presence of the angel. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Come and see the nice tomb, but he isn't there. That's of no relevance. And go quickly, look at verse number seven, and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. There will you see him. You see, it wasn't a secret resurrection. He said, go and wait. He's coming to see you. And we were back in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, and he was seen of Cephas, Simon Peter, then of the 12, then of above 500 brethren, then of James, then all the apostles. And, and, and Acts chapter 1, we have the time today. Read these things. He was seen uh, and proven through his passion, it said, by many infallible proofs. Hundreds of people that knew who Jesus Christ was before he was crucified saw him after his crucifixion, his death, and his burial, and witnessed him after his resurrection for 40 days. People who knew. The Apostle Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 15 to the church at Corinth. He said, you got any doubt? He says, you can go back to Jerusalem. Some of them are still alive, he said. Go and ask them. Don't go and ask the prophet Muhammad. That's a waste of time. Don't read the Quran. They weren't around. They're just guessing. Don't go and ask the Jehovah's false witnesses. They have, oh, Jesus was the archangel Michael, and he went back to being the archangel Michael. They haven't got a clue either. Speak to Jesus and speak with the people. Paul says, you go and ask. They're still alive. Those that walked with him, talked with him, handled him, touched him. They saw him. He taught them for 40 days after his resurrection. They watched him ascend visibly until a cloud took him out of the sight. He's risen. He's alive evermore. Praise God. The most valuable, there's some valuable artifacts in this world, or people put a lot of value on stuff. And but I want to tell you this the most valuable artifacts this world have ever produced is an old rugged cross and an empty tomb. There's nothing more valuable than that, because that's where hope is. Christ humbled himself to become one of us so that by his death and by his resurrection, we can have the power of hope. And we can have the power of truth. We can live in hope and peace, not heaviness and pain. Why? Because death strikes without discrimination. Sometimes it comes in tragedy, doesn't it? And it certainly usually comes when you're not expecting it. Tragic circumstances, terrorist attacks, and so on and so forth. Sometimes death comes in time. You know, so, yeah, they were, they were 96. They lived a good life. You know, they, they lived their life. It's still sad, but it's kind of they had their innings. But sometimes it's tragic. Sometimes it's little children dying of cancer. Well, uh, what I can tell you is, is this. Death cannot be avoided. Death cannot be cancelled. We've got an appointment with it, Hebrews 9 tells us, right? It's appointed unto me once to die, but after this, the judgment. Sometimes death 
It can seemingly be delayed by medical <coughs> intervention. None of us die until God says we're gone. And some of the younger people in the room go, oh, you're talking about death. I'm in my 20s. I'm in my teens. Listen, some of us in this room today in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, five minutes ago, <coughs> were in our teens, 20s, and 30s. You'll be old and ragged before you know it. It will come. None of us can escape from the fate of death, but the resurrection hope is we can be freed from the fear of death and the bondage that it puts us in. The Lord is our great shepherd. He has led in death and resurrection. And what's he saying? Uh, those who you know, follow me. And he says, why don't you follow me in death and resurrection? Now, let me just stop for a minute here. There was a guy on the streets the other week. You know, I know all these people you meet on the streets that when we're out there doing some outreach and they've got all the answers. He said, you, Christian, if you believe that, you don't kill yourself so you could be in a better place. I said, well, well, you're just declaring your ignorance like most people do. Let a fool talk for long enough and they'll always declare their ignorance. I said, I said, heaven is a better place. I said, the Apostle Paul said, better by far, I depart and be with Christ. He said, it's more profitable to stay. I said, our Lord, who has told us we're going to go and be with him, our Lord, who has shown us the way, our Lord, who has broken the fear of death and the bondage. Do you know, some people live their whole life in fear of death. And, and I can understand that. I'm a Christian, man. I know. I'm, I, I'm not rushing. I can enjoy the fullness of this life. When the Lord takes me, the Lord takes me. But this goes out, well, why don't you kill yourself now if it's true? I said, because I come into obedience to Christ. And he says, you stay there and go and tell everybody about this resurrection. You go and tell everybody about this gospel. You you live some purpose in your life until I call you home. I've got the joys and the splendors of eternity waiting for you. Christ is there. You're following Christ. He's coming for you. I said, but the reason I don't kill myself to go and be there is because he who made the way should stay there and fight for it and go and do something useful with the rest of your life. Because for the first 39 years of it, you put a lot of effort into sin. He said, now, for as long as I give you after you got saved at 39, why don't you put some of it into salvation? A resurrection hope? Man, i got so many verses, we're out of time, but let's just go to one. The power, the fear, and the bondage of death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, they're gone. The, the grave has been overcome by Christ. The power of an empty tomb and the resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 55. You see, the power of the empty tomb is this, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? You see, the grave couldn't hold him. Muhammad's in the grave, Buddha's in the grave, all the cult leaders, they're in the grave. Jesus Christ is not in Christ. Amen. Oh, death, where is thy sting? When I was a, when I was a kid, I, I remember, you'll remember it, Mom. I was back with that. Anybody remember space hoppers? But I went, yeah. oh, they were brilliant. Me and my sister used to have some great races around the back garden, jumping over jumps, broomsticks on a couple of buckets and racing around. <laughs> and the one day I kind of went over the jump, my foot came down. You know, we used to run around as kids barefoot in those days, not on the streets, but in the back garden. And came down, and this immense pain went through my leg and I, you know, like a child, I threw myself off my fancy, fancy space opera and I was in tears and uh, and mum comes out and the guy said, oh, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't know, I don't know. I was like, I was probably about nine or ten. I don't know, my foot's hurting. You know, I'm have a look and there's a bee hanging off the bottom of the bridge. So that, that was his sting. And it was painful. And it bothered me then. I was worried about bees. You know, I didn't want to be near. I wasn't scared. I was like, oh, let's get away. Because I was worried about getting stung. And then in our house, as we were growing up, then we ended up with with, with a, a bunch of bees building, like, nests, and they were coming and going out of the wall. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. And then I spoke to mom, and they were like, no, these are masonry bees. They don't, they don't have any sting. You know what? I wasn't worried about them. Then. God says to the people who are not saved, Death has a sting, and you're worried about it. Yeah. To the saved, it says death has no sting. The grave has no victory. Jesus said to me, there's nothing can hurt you now. The, the, the worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that can happen to you. You die, and you're with me. Amen. Because of the resurrection hope, because of the power of the empty tomb.
What a joy it was to speak to that man in the street and say to him, if it was up to me, I'd quite happily finish it and go and be with the Lord. But he said, stay, so I'll stay, because I do as he says, because he's led the way. You see, Christianity rises on the resurrection. There's no gospel without the resurrection. Uh, we're just portraying the teachings of a good teacher if Christ was not God the Son. But the whole gospel is that God himself died on that cross, that God himself overcame death in victory, that God himself, God the Son, lives and is risen, and we are appropriating by belief, by faith, by grace, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We go where he leads. We have his promises. We have his hope. We have his glory and you say you say uh, well you know he didn't really resurrect let me just ask you one more thing and i appreciate your patience this morning it says all of those witnesses that saw the lord jesus christ after he was resurrected now imagine if his body was in tatters it was all a hoax he was on death's door uh, and he said now go into all the world and preach the gospel what do you think they'd have said are you kidding me i'm not putting my life on the line for that but but, but think about this Christ, the risen one, in his glorified body, who'd overcome death, the grave, and death's sting, said to them, now, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, some of you may lose, lose their lives. And they did. Okay. Would you do that for a hoax? I wouldn't do it for a hoax. Would you do that to perpetuate a lie? Of course you wouldn't. You'd only do things that were a hoax or a lie if you had something to gain from it. If all you had to gain in this hoax was, was trying, to, trying to profit from Christ, you know, a, a man and his death, and all you could expect was death, you'd be adios, man, you aren't hard enough for this gig. I'm not playing this game. Why did Christianity turn the world upside down? Why is it still the same today? Why? It's because it was not a hoax. He did not swoon. He wasn't a good man. He was God the Son who actually died in a barbaric way for your sin and my sin, came back to life, made an offer of the gospel and said, anyone who will receive and believe the death, burial and resurrection can expect the promise by dying my death and uh, 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 spiritually and living and rising spiritually and can have the promises of hope and eternal life. And where I go, you can come to be with me. He has led the way. And put a stone on the tomb to guard the tomb. Didn't do a thing. You can put a stone around your heart and life to keep Christ out, but it won't make a difference. And even if you're successful in keeping Christ out in this life, it won't make a difference because the first thing after the moment of your death is you'll meet him. But not as your saviour, you'll meet him as your church. You see, the death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel hope, living hope. But let me tell you this, if you don't receive Christ as your saviour, the resurrection will be the reason for your rejection. And you won't know the glorious promises. You won't know what it is to live a fullness of life in this life. You'll be in bondage and sin and fear and corruption, and you'll do all you can to, to give yourself a few extra days, weeks, or months of life because you know ultimately this is all you've got to put your hope in. And eat, drink, and be merry. Make the most of it because it will be awful for you on the other side. I thank God that the power of the empty tomb gives all who are saved by this year saved and in this year stand because I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever me I say. I hope you know Christ as your Savior. Praise God for the resurrection, the witnessed resurrection. It's true, friends. It's true. Doesn't matter what people say, it's true. Believe God, don't believe man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our great Savior. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love that you display and the mercy that you continue to offer to, to us in this world. But this world is rejecting you at a fast pace now. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus, time is of the essence, time is running out, but I thank you, dear God, for everyone in here today that knows and serves a risen, living Savior. Father, what hope and what joy we have if we go through the trials, the troubles and the tribulations of this world like other people, but, 
But death has no sting. The grave has no victory. Well, that's just our doorway to presence with you. Father, help us to live our life to the fullest because we're not in fear and we're not in bondage. Help us to tell others of the glorious hope of the resurrection. Oh, Lord, we're not peddling just some smooth or simple teachings. We're not peddling some earthly wisdom. We're speaking of and giving evidence of and witness to a living, resurrected hope that's in Jesus Christ, our living Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen.